of a break, um, it's a great pleasure to invite Tom. Um, he's the co-founder of Whole Grain Digital, which is London's original WordPress agency. Um, he's also a certified B Corp and a specialist in web performance and sustainability. Um, his talks around sustainability, um, sustainable UX for everyone, um, and his talk will focus on how digital decisions impact carbon emissions and how sustainability can be used as a lens for which we can improve UX. So I'll hand over to Tom, and that's your clicker. Okay, so I'm going to specifically talk about the, sort of the digital side of sustainable design this evening. And I'm just going to start off with sort of the, some of you already know this, but I'll start off with the sort of headline statistics. Is this the correct clicker? Yeah. <laughs> um, basically, people don't really generally think that the internet has much of an impact. It's not on people's radars in the way that maybe flying or driving a car or using electricity at home is. And... Um, but internet emissions are huge. The internet uses roughly the same amount of electricity as the whole of the UK. Um, so it is like a country. And if it was a country, its emissions would be roughly equivalent to Germany, which is the sixth biggest polluter in the world. And it's basically because everything in the internet uses electricity. It's the biggest machine humans have ever created. It spans the entire globe, um, its data centers, its transmission networks, all of the repeater stations, and then the millions or billions of devices that are constantly connected 24 hours a day um, to the internet, consuming data, sending data. So we set about trying to figure out what does these big top level statistics, what do they mean from the point of view of an individual website? Um, so a couple of years ago, we developed websitecarbon.com, um, which allows you to put in a URL and get a, an idea of what are the individual emissions of that, that web page. Um, and the average, we've tested over a quarter of a million web pages so far, and the average so far is 1.676 grams of CO2 for an average visit, and that's factoring in sort of repeat visitors and the hosting and so on. So this is quite a lot. It's like a sugar cube of in weight of gas every time somebody visits a web page and we're all like clicking away constantly all day visiting stuff so this adds up really really fast and there's a lot of stuff that we can do in terms of design decisions that help to bring this down so as i mentioned these are the sort of the three places where um where we're using electricity data centers transmission networks and end user devices from a design point of view sort of, or UX point of view specifically rather than a technical point of view, it's mainly in the transmission networks and the end user devices that we can really have a big impact. Although from a technical point of view, there's loads of stuff we can do on the data center end as well. Um, but I'm going to focus on these sort of last two points today. So I've got sort of seven top tips from a design point of digital design point of view for how you can reduce these emissions. So the first thing is basically streamline user journeys. Um, if every page that we're visiting is using electricity to send data, and the more time that we spend on the internet, the more electricity we're using, then streamlining user journeys is the single best thing probably that we can do. If people have to go like four levels deep to find the page that they're looking for, then that's a lot of pages they have to load. It's a lot of time wasted. It's a lot of electricity wasted. If they can get straight to what they want, then that's just good for them, it's good for the environment. Um, so, you know, not just the levels of de de depth, but like preventing dead ends, like look at your analytics, find out where people are getting stuck and they're not finding what they want. Um, and also look at SEO, like what's your, what's your negative bounce rate? So bounce rate's a funny metric, but a lot of people who bounce off pages are bouncing off because they didn't find what they wanted. So optimizing the user journey, not just on your site, but in terms of how people arrive and where they're going after your site, can really reduce the amount of time people spend, the amount of data they have to load to achieve what they're trying to achieve on the internet, and they will thank you for it. Um, the second thing is, and this is a really big thing, use images efficiently. So, like, use less images. That's, like, the obvious one. Images tend to be really big files, and most websites that we look at where they've got some sort of um, page speed problem, images are, like, one of the first things that we look at. Um, so you can use less images, you can use like vector files and CSS styles instead of photographs. They're way more efficient in general. Um, but also think about like, when, if you are going to use a photograph, think about how you're going to use it, like the context in which you're going to use it from a design point of view. So I'll just give, run you through an example of how 
one image could be used in a really inefficient way or it could be used in a much more efficient way. So this photograph at 1280 by 800 pixels with no compression as a JPEG, 1.2 megabytes. Like that's massive. Without the rest of the web page, if you put that on a web page, that's already 1.2 megabytes. So, but a lot of people will put that on their website. They'll put it like full screen at the top of the page with no compression. But if you halve it in size and like put white space around it, and white space is good, um, <laughs> then you can get that down with, I don't know why we're skipping forward, but <laughs> you can get that down massively. Um, but this next thing here, if you blur the edges of the picture, if you look at the left-hand image, it's basically the same photograph, but I blurred the edges, and it's 47% smaller as a file, but the image is exactly the same size. And, okay, you might not want to blur the edges of your image, but actually, in a lot of cases on the web, no one's going to notice that you did that. Um, and you can, you can control which bits you blur, um, have some fun with it. But you can also get it even smaller, make it black and white. So color is, you know, it's data, it takes up space. So you make the same image black and white, it's 33% smaller than the one on the left. And it's 64% smaller than the original one of the same size. If we go to the next page, then convert the same images from JPEG to WebP. WebP is way more efficient than JPEG. And every website should be using this now. Nearly all the browsers support it. So just converting them with almost no compression, um, you can get the files down significantly smaller. So basically, the image on the right in WebP format is 81% smaller than the original image of the same size. Um, and yeah, it's black and white, but you know, maybe on some websites that's a good, good, good look. Um, <laughs> but even if it's black and white, you can add the color back with CSS. So, um, so you can use CSA, uh, CSS overlay effects, um, and it doesn't change the image size at all, but it adds some sort of visual style back in. And you can use these in sort of interactions and so on, so that it actually creates a bit of life and doesn't um, make everything flat. So loads of things you can do with images to get files really, really small. And as I said, this is WebP files with almost no compression. It's like 96% quality. You could shrink that down even further. Um, so this is a 67 kilobyte image. That one we started with was 1.2 megabytes. Um, it looks basically the same. So the next thing, obviously, following on from images is use less video. Video files are massive. Streaming video uses a huge amount of data. And that's OK if there's like a good reason to be using video. If that's like the best format to communicate what you're communicating, then you know, let's, not be, let's not be sort of Puritan about it. But there's a lot of things we can do. Like autoplay video is often annoying. Um, <laughs> it uses loads of data for every person that visits, even if they don't want to watch the video. If it's got sound, then you know you could get some people fired for <laughs> visiting your website while they're supposed to be doing work. Um, but also question whether video is the best content format. Like video is not always that great if you want to learn something. It's it's good in some contexts, but often. It's not the best. It doesn't give you control over the timeline. So if you're looking for something quickly and you just want to like skim read something, find a fact, and move on, and then there's like a five-minute video and you don't know whether the thing you want to know is in that video somewhere, you have to watch the whole video just to find out that that was a waste of time. So video is not always brilliant. Um, so think carefully about what your users are looking for, what they want to consume, and whether video is the right format. Um, if you are going to use video, just see how short you can make it. You don't. Not everyone wants to watch like a full-length feature documentary. Um, avoid animated GIFs. They're just horrible files. <laughs> and, <laughs> and they're really inefficient because it's basically just loads and loads of GIF images stuck on top of each other. So if you're going to use something that looks like a GIF, convert it to a video because um, video is way more efficient. And use MPEG-4 format or in future, whatever the next most efficient thing is that comes after that. Always use the most efficient file formats. So number four, use system fonts. So s system fonts is basically the fonts that come on your device by default. Not everyone likes them. Um, it's things like Arial, Times New Roman. On Android devices, you've got Roboto. Um, and yeah, OK, a lot of designers hate system fonts because they look old fashioned and they're not very exciting. But you get them for free. Like You don't have to load anything. They're already on everybody's devices. 
Um, and some websites use these really well, like Hotels.com only uses System Fonts, and that's great for web performance. Um, it keeps their file sizes down. If you must use custom fonts, which you probably want to, um, <laughs> then optimize them as far as you can. So um, this is just an example of an open source font called InterUI. It comes by default as a TTF series of TTF files. It contains 2,192 characters, 39 languages. It comes in nine weights, and every single weight is 300 kilobytes. So if you wanted to use all nine weights on your website, that's nine times 300 kilobytes. You do the maths. Like your, <laughs> your website's huge. But it doesn't have to be this way. You can reduce the number of weights that you use. So you probably don't need all nine weights. So on our website, we use InterUI. We only have one weight, um, which we use for headings. Um, then you can change the file format. You can convert it really easily. So convert it from TDF to WAF2 makes a huge difference in file size. But then you can also subset fonts. So we don't need 2,192 characters on our website, and we don't need 39 languages because our website is only in English. So we basically stripped out all the characters that we're never going to need, and we got it down to 98 characters, which covers two languages. I don't know what the second one is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's whatever language uses the same characters as English. Um, and the file size is seven kilobytes. So we've shaved, saved, shaved nearly 98% off the file size um, just by doing that. And no one will ever know. It looks exactly the same because we're just not loading stuff that we were never going to use. So my tip number six is go easy on the icing. Um, and what I mean by icing is like all those fancy fun things, that like the jazzy stuff that people love on a website. Um, that doesn't really do anything practical. Um, so we're talking about animations, like sh shapes transforming, parallax effects, um, cropping things into like sh masked shapes, things like that. This stuff can look great, it can be fun, and there can be good uses for it. So, um, but think carefully about how you use it. It can really use a lot of CPU energy, so even though it might not increase file sizes, if, if the fans start whirring, on somebody's laptop when they visit that website, then you know there's a problem, and and you can use this tool. Whoop, you can use the tool um, in Safari developer tools in the browser Safari. Um, they've got an energy impact monitor, which is the right hand dial. Um, so if so, basically just experiment. Like try different effects that you think are going to create a good user experience, like nice interactions and things, and test the energy impact and see which ones you can get sort of the best bang for your buck. Um, and just keep learning. And then number seven, use low energy colors. So this is only relevant on OLED screens because they light up each pixel individually, whereas sort of older screens like LCDs and CRT screens, um, well, LCD screens in particular, not CRT, um, it doesn't make any difference what colors you use. But on OLED screens, it does make a difference. And most new phones use OLED screens. A lot of new laptops use them. A lot of TVs now use them. And basically, because they light up each pixel individually, white uses the most energy because white light is the brightest. Black doesn't use any energy because it's basically the whole screen switched off. Um, <laughs> dark colors are low energy for obvious reasons. And then if within the colors, weirdly, blue uses about 25% more energy than green or red pixels. So basically, the darker you can make your designs, the less white you can use, the less blue you can use, the better which is bad because Whole Grain Digital's entire brand is mainly white and blue. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we are changing our brand color palette quite drastically, <laughs> very soon. <laughs> um, so that is my seven top tips. Um, and the benefits basically of doing these things, thinking about sustainability in digital design, um, you will shorten user journeys. People will thank you for that you will deliver better web performance. That's only ever going to be a good thing. Um, your SEO will improve because not only have you thought about SEO in its own right, but you've also improved web performance, which is good for Google rankings. Better accessibility, so by making things super, super efficient and making them able to work on low-powered devices, it's, it's easier for people who have rubbish internet connections and poor quality devices or old devices or you know whatever happens to be their, their limitation 
um, easier to access your website without being frustrated. Um, and of course, less energy and emissions. And there's only one downside, and that's that it needs attention to detail. And we're all busy, we all have limited amounts of time, and sometimes it just feels like stopping and thinking about these things is not the highest priority. But actually, when we do it, the benefits are huge. So it's, it's really worth it. So that's pretty much the end. I s encourage you to go and take a look at the Sustainable Web Manifesto, read it, sign it, um, and experiment, share your ideas. Thank you so much, Tom. I think there's some really good like, practical insights and, and takeaways and, and so many great messages and um, hopefully a lot of what everyone was really interested in hearing about. Um, I was chatting with Tom, um, something I found really interesting today, the BBC um, published a documentary called Dirty Streaming. Um, it's only a BBC Three kind of short 25 minute documentary. Um, but it was really interesting around video and all of the streaming and, you know, Netflix, Amazon Prime, what everyone's doing when they get home and we're such big, heavy content users um, and the amount of power that that's taking and the transmission energy around the world. Um, something I learned that even um, for a HD video, if you switch to SD, then it uses between four to five times less energy um, and actually human eyesight and different things we don't need all of this super high quality um and even the guys at the back so tonight they only stream in 4k so it's kind of oh okay that's that's pretty easy a lot of power but um it just gets the brain you know there's there's so many things for us to think about i think as um majority designers um people working in product in the room there's there's lots of things um we can take away from tonight and continue the conversation as well um so we'll open the floor up to questions is there any questions for tom yeah, we've got the gentleman here. If you just wait for the microphone so we can hear you um, at the back. So we'll run around. Cool, yeah, perfect. I'm, uh, I'm not sure if this falls beyond the remit of the talk, but earlier on you touched upon the fact that um, you know even hosting can have significant impacts on the... Uh, I guess the environmental footprint a website has. Do you know of any providers, maybe AWS or Google, that have uh, that are very environmentally conscious that we can maybe make a concerted effort of maybe using more of in the future? Yeah, absolutely. So, like data centers do use a huge amount of energy, and I, the two key factors there are looking at the ones that have a credible and strong commitment to renewable energy in their data centers, um, and the ones that have a strong commitment to energy efficiency, because that's equally important. Um, Google is sort of the most sort of well known in terms of pushing the boundaries of what the industry can do in terms of energy efficiency and they've also made a commitment to 100% renewable energy which they say they've achieved. Once you start digging into it, it all gets very blurry as to what 100% renewable energy really does mean in practice um, and nobody's there yet really in practice and Google even themselves will admit it if you, you really dig into it. But um, but Google is a good one. There's some smaller companies like Positive Internet, which are based in London, and their data centers in Cambridgeshire. Um, uh, Crystal Hosting, who are also a UK-based one, have quite a strong commitment. Um, Qualo is another one that people have said to us is good. We haven't personally used them. Um, and then there's loads of stuff that's built on top of other providers. So there's loads of hosting companies that are basically piggybacking off Google's data centers and providing other services. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, I thought that was really interesting. Do you have any kind of tips or examples of how you uh, sell in these ideas to clients or stakeholders, how you convince them to cut stuff? Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it's really hard. Um, <laughs> everyone likes shiny, flashy things, right? Um, even if there's no like tangible rationale for them. Um, so what we found is like you've got to figure out what the client really cares about. And some clients might really care about the environment and that might be something that they actually want to engage in as an issue and they want to actually sort of look into it deeply and, and go on that journey. For a lot of clients, even though they may care about it, it's not the top of their priority list. It's the nice to have. Um, so you've got to figure out what they do care about. And we tend to find that they care more about things like web performance, SEO, accessibility. So that's fine. Um, ultimately, you can achieve the you can achieve the efficiency, but under the guise of one of the other things. So, yeah, 
try and figure out what they care about and sell it to them that way. That's it's not always easy. It doesn't always work. <laughs> cool. Awesome. Um, so I think we'll head on to. Do you have a one, one question from Chris? Can you get a microphone just over to Chris? So yeah, one more question, and we'll head for a break. So. Thanks, Tom. Great presentation. I'm speaking after the uh, break, so you can ask me a really difficult question after this. But um, actually, it's not a difficult question. Yeah, just uh, uh, mine's about um, where's whether there's a sort of decoupling point between uh, the way we decarbonize energy generation. Because, of course, you know, kind of, I guess the, whatever, the footprint of the internet is increasing, but simultaneously the footprint of energy generation as we decarbonize and move to renewables is decreasing. So is there any, is your 1.6, whatever it was, grams, you know, sort of reducing as a result of, a, of, of renewable energy policy? It is. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's also reducing as a result of the technology that powers the internet is constantly getting more and more efficient. So data centers are getting more efficient, transmission networks are getting more efficient, and our devices, our phones, our laptops, and so on are constantly getting more energy efficient. So that number per page view is always going to be coming down. And eventually, we will create a truly zero carbon world. Maybe <laughs> who knows when? But eventually, it should become a non-issue because the internet will be so efficient and all of the world's energy will come from renewables. Problem solved. We're so far from it currently that um, we st still got to treat it as the issue that it is. But yes, you're right. Eventually, we'll get there. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you.